the day the final Ad Astra episode is here, and no one is happier than Bandit. <laughs> Hey guys, it's Ivo Bodedago, and welcome back to Ad Astra, the final episode. But it's not the final episode with these characters, because as you know, there is uh, Intera and Kimia as well. So uh, we'll see about that later. Just know that this isn't the last time we see these characters, so don't worry. Anyhow, we are going back to Earth today, so I'm not gonna drag this out anymore. And if you need to cry, it's, it's okay. Big boys all also cry. I I don't I don't cry. I never I have never cried for a video game. But if you cry, it's okay. Now let's go. <laughs> hey Alex, I'm still feeling bizarrely high and confident from my trip. Um, uh, hello. Oh, this is good. I actually wanted to talk to you before I leave. Uh, oh, uh, what about? Well, first of all, what are you doing here? Cassius steps forward unsteadily, pointing at me, I think. His finger kind of drifts off to the side. What right do you have to question him, human? Alex quickly grabs one of Cassius' arms and tries to pull him back. Cassius, please! You're acting very uppity for someone who is considered a pet, even if you did win my brother's favor. I lean against the doorway casually, smiling. Oh, I want more than that. But if you really want, I can call Amicus. He should have the proper authority. No! Alex freezes and every inch of his fur bristles out. I wait, not saying anything, but Alex also saying nothing, just clinging to Cassius' arm as he stares at me, as if just moving will lead me to making good on my threat. Well, maybe then we can start with what you are doing here. Last I heard, you were banished from the palace. Cassius steps forward again, stumbling a bit as he drags Alex along. Enough of intimidating my cat. We are here to claim my father's ship, which we will then pilot to Omophora. Alex stares open mouth at Cassius, clearly shocked at how quickly his plan had just been revealed. Cassius! What? Am I saying something wrong? Well, consider it your own fault, as you wouldn't stop pressing the wine bottle into my mouth. Alexius can only stare back at the wolf, mouth agape before he snaps it close and turns to me. My master is simply drunk, if that wasn't already obvious. I am perfectly coherent, despite my slightly inhibited state. Coherency isn't the issue, Cass! Alex is as angry at the wolf before turning back to me, smoothing his fur down. My master brought me here simply because he wanted to. As his pet, I have no choice but to obey. I see Alexius' paw grip more tightly around Cassius' arm, warning him. Ow! What did I say about being sore? As I finally recognize that, I look into Alex's eyes. So, you're planning to steal the Emperor's ship? Which is Amigo's ship by now, by the way? Just before I was due to leave? Oh, you're leaving? Alex isn't even trying at this point. Man, you're a real piece of shit, you know that? And you are a reckless ape with no consideration for the rest of the galaxy! I blink in surprise. Though, I am a little satisfied to see that I've gotten through his shield of indifference. Cassius, who had opened his mouth to butt in again, suddenly pauses, raising an eyebrow at the two of us. Wait a moment, do you have some sort of history? You speak in a familiar way to each other. No, Cassius, only in passing. I remember then that Alex had tried to keep our interactions hidden from Cassius, though not the information I'd unwittingly given to the cat during our many conversations. I ignored the wolf at that moment, unwilling to let this traitorous feline get the last word in. And you have no consideration for the lives of anyone on this moon! I turned to Cassius. And how did you explain to still wanted to get with this cat when he's responsible for most of the terrible things that happened to us last year? To your family? Don't talk to him, Cassius. Let's just leave. No, no, you're not leaving. Otherwise, I'm calling Amicus. I look at Alex, who purses his lips tightly, before turning my attention back to Cassius. That is none of your concern, but if you must know, then... Cassius? Consider how you would feel, left in a position in which the intents of your entire society rested upon your shoulders. He had little choice while also underestimating Kato's brutality. Cassius' words are less slurred now, the topic of conversation seeming to have sobered him up a bit. 
he did have a choice to accept his assignment, as I put it, and I think he's smart enough to know that his actions would destroy countless of lives. You misunderstand. His choice was an illusion so as to assure the cats, especially the ones giving the commands, that they are still grounded by their values. I fully understand this, and so did Amicus when I explained the situation. We have both been left in such positions before. I shake my head. How could you not blame him for the death and destruction of your people? Bo, he was only the stylus. I blame the hand of his government that welded him like a disposable tool. Alex is tugging on the wolf's arm again, pulling him towards the main exit. Cassius, let's just leave. There is more wine in our apartment. I sigh, realizing that I probably won't ever have my questions about Alex answered, that he'll probably never get what he deserves. It still bothers me that he got away so easily, that Cassius shields him from any sort of comeuppance. Why do you trust him, Cassius? He's a traitor, but here you are, leaving your empire vulnerable by letting him close to you, the brother of the Emperor. Cassius pouts, putting an arm around Alexius. Because we understand each other, Bo. Just as you and Amicus somehow understood each other. I've grown tired of the games and politics. I simply want peace with an understanding partner. By running away to Umafora? Last I heard, they despite your kind. Actually, we're similar in many ways. One being our shared culture. I try not to roll my eyes at the word shared. And the other being the fact that the cats now oppose the parents. I believe that this can result in plenty of common gr- COME ON! Yeah. Alex yanks the wolf, making Cassius yelp before strumbling after the cat. Ah, oh, son of the whore, Alex! You're lucky I'm drunk, otherwise you could have seriously injured me! I watched the two of them disappear through the exit. Part of me wanted to call security and have the cat arrested for trying to hijack Amicus ship. At the same time though, I wonder if it will do us any good, considering what the cat has already gone away with. Still, I feel like Cassius seemingly wanted to abandon the Empire, while drunk or not, is something that Amicus should know about. I decided I will tell Amicus, but when we're both on our way back to Earth, and he has time to think over what he wants to do about this. As for Alex as a whole, I suppose his motivation and Cassius' willingness to offend him makes a little more sense, but I still don't like any of it. We all have a choice, whether you want to pretend it's an illusion or not. And I'm in the process of making my own right now. I head back to our bedroom, suddenly extremely tired as the euphoria begins to wear off. I still feel like I've lived an entire lifetime in just half an hour. So when I find Amicus in the same position on the couch, I practically fall back into his arms. He shifts when I do, then hugs me tight before falling back to sleep. I wiggle myself deeper into his embrace before doing the same, falling asleep almost instantly. It only seems like a second passes before I feel myself being moved around. Then I feel Amicus paw on my head, gently nudging me out of sleep. Hey there, love. It's time to get ready. I stand off to the side, watching Amicus load up the ship while checking various gadgets. Virginia and Efero make small talk, the kind that makes it feel as if I'm not going away for 8 years, that everything is still normal. Then I had to remind myself that this technically isn't normal, even though it feels that way now. Finally, Amicus walks up to us, brushing his paws together. Well, it's about time to take off. I should be back in no more than two days, Virginia. I certainly hope that to be the case, considering how much work I will pile up. I'll try to keep the Empire from rebelling while you're gone, though. Thank you, Virginia. And I look forward to our next reunion, Bo. I hope your experience contributes to a more disciplined character. Uh, thanks? Of course. Virginia sticks out the paw, and I blink at it until I realize what she's doing. The way I first greeted her. I bent to kiss it. Goodbye, Bo. I step back awkwardly. Bye. Then the ferris paw sticks out, and I hear Amicus sigh loudly next to me. <laughs> I don't humor the jackal, though. Instead, just forcing it into an awkward handshake. That's a new one. Another human greeting. I'll have to show you more when I see you next time. Whenever that might be. It'll happen, I promise. Nefero raises an eyebrow at my assertiveness, but nods. Well, here's a key and goodbye. One between those who are close. He then leans down, pulling me forward. Machine rests on his shoulder. 
his paw coming up to rest on my head, his cheek pressed to mine. May Auteb be with you on every step of your journey, brother, and may he help you to find all that you seek. I expect Amicus to make more noise of disapproval, but is quiet. I stand there for a few moments, then awkwardly put my hand on the jackal's head, hoping I'm returning the gesture appropriately. I stand still until Nefero lets go and pulls back. Never heard you call me brother before. It's a farewell normally reserved for siblings. I haven't performed it since I last saw my sister on Kimia, in fact. You see me as a brother? Close enough. Until we meet again, friend. Uh, thanks, and yeah, uh, until then, Nefero. Amicus coughs awkwardly, stepping forward and putting his paw around my shoulder. All right, see you all when I return. Virginia smiles and a fairy nods as we turn away from them, Amicus leading the way to the ship that's parked in the palace lawn. He jumps in first, then reaches down to help pull me up. As soon as I'm inside, the door closes before I can look back. I'm struck by the fact that I haven't been inside this ship since I first got here, yet it's all so familiar. All right, let's make sure that we have everything. Ambicus walks around the back of the ship, looking at various compartments, and looking at the utility closet that I've once been stuffed into. He opens the doors to his quarters, doing more checks. I move to the seat that I sat in a year ago, and look out the window. Virginia Nefero stands by the entrance of the palace, still watching. I wave, and Nefero raises a paw in acknowledgement. Everything appears to be in order. Come, initiate liftoff. Liftoff sequence engaged. The ship rumbles, though there isn't any other sound as we begin to lift off the ground. Amicus sits heavily in the seat with a thump, buckling his seatbelt while I'll do the same. I watch out the window as Nefero, Virginia and the palace grow smaller and smaller, along with the entire city of Adastra. It's not unlike taking off from the airport on my way to Rome, though this is much faster. Before I know it, the glittering city fades into a small sparkling spot of lights on the globe of the moon. I stare out at Adastra at the little patches of glistering lights indicating the cities, and at the long stretches of dark blue that indicates the oceans. That's when I notice Amicus watching me closely. What? The big wolf shrugs. Oh, just curious as to how you might feel at this moment. I must say, you seem less stressed than you had been last night. I go back to looking out the window, getting the last look at Adastra, along with the smaller Torquay and the much larger Ancoris. I guess things just became... Clearer. Kind of like you said they would. Amicus grins, and I now get the feeling that he knows exactly what I saw. Sufficient distance achieved. Prepare to enter the stretch drive. Amicus reaches out the paw, and I take it. Then you know that there's much ahead of us. Together. I nod. Too many different emotions conflicting inside me to understand how I exactly feel as I watch Adastra get smaller and smaller. Then... It's gone, replaced with a warped space and unimaginable distance. About 10 hours. That's how much time we have before we get to Earth. We agree to stay up and treat it like having an entire day to ourselves. Two hours pass quickly as we lie on the cot as Amicus entertains me with the various food we had stashed in the compartments along the wall. He'd brought plenty this time. He'd learned his lesson the first time after he ran out and had to rely on the less than savory protein mud shake. As for the space travel food, they apparently can't go bad, so we open every single one, taste testing them and ranking them from the worst to best. Amicus is surprised that our rankings are nearly opposite to each other, even though I expected it. But you're always wanting anything sweet, Amicus. Yes, because sweet is good. Sometimes, but I'd rather have something that's more salty and savory rather than sweet. But why? It's like dessert all the time! There's a reason dessert is small and comes last, Amicus. I don't see the reason. Ever heard of too much of a good thing? If something is good, there can never be enough of it. Amicus flicks a round blue pebble-like pellet in his mouth that I assume to be some sort of fruit-flavored candy. I settle with munching on my salty potato-like dried vegetable, finding it sad that it's a bit better than most of the bland food on Adastra. Did your parents, like, ban you from eating anything sweet or something? Ambicus pauses, in the process of pouring half the bag into his muzzle, before talking with his mouth full. Oh yeah, how, how did you know? I grimace. So that's how you ran out of food last time. 
Amicus chews for a while, then swallows. It's not like I'm always eating sweets. Virginia disallowed me from doing so as well. I'm simply taking advantage of not being under supervision at the moment. Amicus, your consumption of sugar has exceeded your daily limits. A report for Virginia has been filed and will be supplied to her upon landing on Alastra. <laughs> Amicus pauses, then shrugs, pouring the rest of the bag into his mouth. Well, uh, as long as you have the parental tech to keep you healthy. We do. Everything in my body is regulated to normal levels once a month. Wow, lucky you. So I am technically free from any poor choice I make diet-wise. I'm simply kept away from sweets to discipline my impulses. <laughs> well, that's clearly not working at all. Amicus smirks at me before opening another bag of what looks like candy. I glare at him, poking him in the stomach, making him grunt. I think you're actually gaining a little more weight. The wolf claps his stomach with a hard smack. This is part of my stature, and it's important for my center of gravity in combat. Oh really? I move to sit in Amicus' lap, rubbing my face against his bulk. <laughs> yes, you see how handily I handle you when we wrestle, and besides, you like it. I rest my head against his chest, feeling the softness of his strong body swell around me with each breath he takes. You got me there. I listen to the candies crack around in his mouth against the teeth and against each other. I've been savoring everything about him that I can, even these sounds of just him eating candy. We sit there in silence for a bit, becoming all too aware of the passage of time. I take a deep breath. So, uh, will we be able to communicate at all over the next eight years? Amicus pauses, his mood lowering a bit to match mine. That's hard to say. I wondered similar things, but I have not received an answer. I sigh deeply. <sighs> Sometimes I hate the parents. Amicus laughs, a stark contrast to how he would have reacted to such a statement a year ago. They are frustrating, to say the least. I have a feeling that we will, though. Yeah? Yes, they work in very mysterious ways. I believe it's clear now that the archives are not their only method of communication. I think the two of us joining together in, say, a dream would not be out of the realm of possibility. The confidence I originally felt while leaving Adastra is fading away at this point. Instead, I feel that familiar feeling of dread and uncertainty take over my mind. I hug Amicus harder, pressing my face into his fur, inhaling the lavender scent. I mumble it to his chest. I'm scared. Oh, why is that? There's nothing to be afraid of. Amicus hugs me tightly, nuzzling my hair. Even now, he's managing to hold it together somehow, and that actually makes me feel a little grateful. I don't know how I would be able to do this if he was acting as unsure as I am right now. You know how big of a fuck up I am. What if I do something wrong? Amicus chuckles. I feel that the parents would not attempt this unless they themselves were certain of success. Simply follow their guidance. I'm silent at that, and Amicus knows why. I know what we were experienced with Kato was terrible. They weren't able to... see as clearly. I know that they are much more confident here. I don't know how I feel about being guided by gods that don't know what they're doing. Well, they are not gods, which is why they are prone to mistakes. But the time I've spent communicating with them over the past year has left me a bit more confident in their capabilities. I squeeze my eyes letting the small amount of tears that had built up get soaked in the wall's fur so he doesn't see when I look up at him. Why is that? He smiles at me, placing a paw against my head, pushing it back down against his shoulder. Well, they have far more tools at their disposal than we do. I mean, they actually see the future in some ways. If I must trust anyone with my future, it would be the parents. I just don't want to mess up and not be able to see you again. Amicus' expression grows stern. That will not happen. I will make sure of it, no matter what the parents say. But do we even have a choice? Doesn't it bother you that it feels like we don't have a say in anything? These are conversations that we had before, but for some reason I kept flip-flopping over whether or not I actually have a choice here. We do. We just have the advantage of knowing the alternatives, and that this path is much more desirable. I'm reminded that while Amicus might be more open to criticizing the parents, he certainly still believes in their plan. I don't know if I feel the same quite yet. You saw the future? Amicus pauses, 
probably wondering if it's okay to share. He seems to make up his mind. Yes. It was beautiful. I just... I wonder if it's not really going to happen. I've only thought of it now, but what if they're just leading us on? Amicus grunts his surprise, clearly not having thought of that himself. They wouldn't do that. But I suppose there is some degree of trust that goes in this, yeah? We're here because of them. All of us are. And I have to trust that. I sigh deeply. I just wish we could run away on some other peaceful planet or something. But I also know that we wouldn't be together unless we were meant to do this. So I guess that's partly why I'm going along with it. You know, judging by the vision, I think we'll come to believe in our mission over time. I hope so. Amicus slowly pulls me back to lie down with him, both of us lying on our sides as he spoons me. I try to think of something to say. Anything, really. Time is truly running out, but I still come up short. Instead, I lie back against Amicus, among the many silver wrappers of food, listen to him suck on his candies. It's comfortable, and for a moment I let go of my worries, and the tiredness of the night before catches up to me. Exiting the stretch drive. Prepare for arrival in 20 minutes. I come to with a sudden jolt, Amicus jumping behind me as well. I sit up, rubbing my eyes. W wait, already? Amicus sits up next to me, a paw on my back. Are you alright? Damn it, Amicus! We were supposed to stay up! There's a sinking feeling in my chest as I realize that we slept away most of the time that we had to travel. Why'd you let me fall asleep? I look at him accusingly, even as my eyes start to blur with tears. Sorry, we were both so tired, and you seen that piece, and I didn't- Ugh! I throw off the blanket that Amicus had pulled over us, and step out of the bed, turning away in case I break down like a little kid. Bo? I act like I don't hear him, moving to the cockpit area to look out the windows. Sure enough, we're no longer in stretch, instead drifting towards a familiar globe in the distance. Approaching Earth, we'll arrive at Bo's residence in Rome, Italy. A heavy paw rests on my back. Bo? We're out of time. The lump in my throat makes it hard to talk. Slowly, Amicus hugs me. Bo, we did have time. Several months, in fact. A few hours on the ship is no time lost. <laughs> Any time is time lost at this point. Amicus doesn't say anything, and I lean my head back against him, swallowing down my bitter attitude because I'm not about to let it ruin our last moments together. Sorry, I'm just... I'm just not ready. I'll be able to come into your apartment. We do still have a little bit of time left, you know? I nod quietly, allowing Amicus to hold me for a bit until we have to get back into our receipts for re-entry. I feel slightly queasy as we approach Earth at an unreal speed. I quickly spot Europe. The brilliant sprouts of light spanning the continent as a whole are far more intense than any city on Adastra. Italy's characteristic boot-like shape stands out of the darkness of the seas that surrounds it. I focus on the glittering patch that I know is Rome, and within seconds we're descending into it. Won't everyone see us? We're cloaked. I trust what the wolf says, even though I haven't noticed any difference. We continue to descend at a rapid pace, and as we approach the block of apartments, I grip onto the seat in anticipation of a hard landing, but our sudden, yet gradual halt is gentle. We come to a rest on the roof of my residence. You landed on the roof? Indeed, there was no room elsewhere. Amicus opens the door and jumps out, and again, I'm worried about being seen. But when he helps me out, I realize how dark it is. Stretch schedule indicates liftoff should commence in 15 minutes. Another twist in my chest as we're down to literary minutes. Amicus leads the way to a fire escape, and I'm struck by how strange it is seeing my wolf framed by this humor world. The sights of Rome, the sound of distance traffic. It almost makes me dizzy with how familiar it is, despite having been away for so long. Amicus stops at the balcony, and I trust that's the one to my apartment, as he boldly slides open the door, apparently aware that the landlord never seems to keep it locked. I step inside, and through the darkness I can see that my personal belongings are gone, obviously. It's cleaned out and looks about the same as when I first got there. 
it's empty, luckily. And I have to wonder if anyone has stayed here since I went missing. Probably not if there was an investigation. I swallow hard, remembering how much media coverage and documentaries there were about the two Canadian and British students that went missing here a few years ago. And the coverage of an Australian student who disappeared a week before I arrived. I hope I didn't get the same treatment when I was away, but I get the feeling that I must have. I shake my head, once again wondering where to even begin. I turn around, seeing Amica standing there, and immediately get a painful, stabbing feeling between my throat and chest. Aww. His pose and demeanor is finally reflecting that our time is coming to an end. We both stand a few feet apart, unsure of what to say. Well, um... Yeah. I suppose we should begin our farewells. Yeah, until next time at least. Yes, it will only be a moment in the overall time that we will have together. Yeah, I'll bet when you come back to get me, it will be like, Wow, it was only yesterday you dropped me off. Of course, not even a full day. It will feel like hours, I'm sure. The parents call it a cosmic microsecond or something. <laughs> oh, well, probably a bit longer than a microsecond. Though I am unsure of the length of a cosmic one. Eight years, I guess. I suppose that would be the case. I try not to think about all the things that are gonna make me cry. Like the thought of not waking up to Amicus for the first time in months. Or the fact that I won't have someone to really talk to at the end of the day. Like I won't have someone who is genuinely kind of loving towards me, like no one ever was before. I swallow the lump in my throat again. No, I'll have time to fall apart as soon as he leaves. I step forward and hug Amicus, burying my face in the warmth of his furry body, breathing in his scent. I'm determined to imprint this moment in my mind, something to help weather what I'm sure will be a hard eight years. He rocks us back and forth for a moment, kissing my head like he always does. You are more than prepared for this. You are strong. Why else would you have been chosen? Thanks. And you'll continue to be an amazing emperor, Amicus. Here's hoping. Though I still don't even know what to do right now, to be honest. Like, do I just walk out into the street next? Oh! Amicus steps back, feeling around in his cape and trousers. I really hope I remember... Oh, here! Amicus pulls out a slim silver rod, about a foot long. It's one of those holographic tablets that I've seen the Imperial family carrying around every now and then. Aside from Amicus. I've got an impression that he just isn't fond of electronics. The Paris have instructed me to give you this. It will connect to your lingua, which will transmit and display information that you might need. Otherwise, uh, all communication will be throughout the lingua. I reach out, taking it, the cold metal light in my hands. You almost forgot to give it to me. Oh yeah, <laughs> well, uh, I did remember. I sigh, turning the rod over in my hands. You turn it on by tapping the top. I do as I'm told, and the blue glowing plane slides out of the rod, like a page attached to the spine of a book. It's blank for now. Just wait until they're off for instructions. Okay. I tap the top of the rod again, and the hologram recedes. Another awkward moment of silence. Then... Bo, I am so happy to have met you. And I thank you. You have made me a better man. And though this will be painful... Amicus' voice cracks. His resolve to remain strong finally gives in. I... I will think of you every day, and we will meet again in eight, eight years, no matter what might happen between now and then. I will see you again. His voice is strained as he struggles to get his words out. Then the tears really begin spilling over. Damn it! Amicus raises a paw to cover his face in frustration, like he actually planned on not crying before we parted ways. And I find that silly, because of course we'd cry. I'm doing the same as I move forward and wrap him up in a tight, almost desperate hug. He crushes me to his body, letting out a loud, gasping sob through his teeth as I feel the wetness of his tears land on my head. 
I love you so much, Bo. I love you too. <laughs> like I said, this is simply a stone in the way of the chariot's wheel. These few years are simply the push, and we will be on our way again. And, and things will get easier over time. Without a doubt. And remember your ring. Though I might be moving away, I'm moving right towards you from the other side. We are permanently connected. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the universe is spherical. And I don't care about the other theories. We both stand there, holding each other, trembling and sobbing. After a few minutes though, we both calm down a little, and eventually I hear calm buzzing faintly in Amico's ear. Lift off sequence should be engaged in one minute. Amico steps back, firmly gripping my shoulders. He's smiling through the tears. And I think that we will see each other before then. The Paris are mysterious, like I said. Definitely. Bo, my lover. My partner, my future husband, I love you. And you know I love you too. Ambicus pulls me against his chest again, hard, squeezing me. You will have an you will have amazing success here, and I'll see you soon, very soon. He plants a kiss on my mouth, and I have just enough time to kiss back before my wolf turns away and disappears out the balcony door. I listen to the mechanical sounds of his footsteps, hurrying up the fire escape, then nothing until there's a soft hum that I can only imagine is the ship before it's silent again. I stand there in the dark room before feeling a little stunned. No! Feeling a little stunned before moving to turn on the light. I stand there, staring, unsure of how to feel. For the moment, it's mostly just an empty feeling. One that I'm sure will start to ache as I come to realize how lonely I actually am. For now though, I move to the desk, waiting, thinking. Then I set the metal rod on top of the desk and tap the top. The blue plane appears again and I stare at it. It's blank and I start to wonder if I should keep it open. Maybe I should try to get some more sleep before facing what I'm sure will be a chaotic day. At that moment though, I feel a twitch in my left eyelid. Then words appear on the blue plane. Proceed to European Commission's offices. A committee is expecting your arrival in one hour and twenty minutes. I stare at those words, realizing that I might not actually be alone among humanity having all of this knowledge. I look around as if I have something to take with me. But no, I'm still in my robes. People will probably just think that I'm a street performer or a crazy tourist. At uh, three in the morning. My eyelid twists again, and a map appears on the screen, showing me a half-hour walk through various alleys and back streets, meant to keep me out of sight, I imagine. So, with a deep breath, I pocket my alien gadget, preparing myself to begin this journey. I'm scared, but also relieved that things are moving so quickly. And also relieved that this will keep my mind off the separation I just experienced. With any luck, I'll be kept busy enough that I won't have to feel the full brunt of all that agony all at once. I look back into the room where it all started, taking a deep breath. I'm actually kind of excited. The thing I've been dreading for months has now started, and that gives me a boost of adrenaline, preparing myself to face my duty. Then I turn off the light, leaving the apartment behind, ready to start another new life. That was it. That, huh, that was that Astra. Okay. <sighs> oh, and he has a ring on. Whoa, Amicus. Oh, there's more! I make my way quickly through the throne room, trying my best to contain my excitement. The most difficult part of this exciting new life I have is pretending that I'm not excited at all. So I try to look dignified as I walk into the throne room, 
toward Amico seated in the back. I stop and bow as low as I possibly can. No need for that. What news do you have for me, Scorpio? Unfortunately, I can't stop the smile from spreading across my face as I hold up the message. The Pharaoh has accepted our request. The diplomatic mission may commence as soon as you're ready, Emperor Amicus. <sighs> Ooh, to be continued in Kimia, I bet. Oh, that's the build-up for Kimia, cool! My god. I, I actually can't believe that we're finished with an Astra. That was... That, that was... I mean, of course there are more content. There is Kimia, as I talked plenty of time before, Kimia and Intira. And there's also a fan game I've been thinking about checking out. But the main Ad Astra story is over for now. Ah, oh, Okay. <laughs> I promise, if I wouldn't have to be so concentrated on reading during that last part and voice acting and trying to keep calm, I would have been crying my eyes out at that last part. Holy shit. But as I said in the beginning, I have never cried for a video game. <laughs> oh my god, what should we do next? Let me know what you think we should do next. I have many ideas of what to do next, but let me know what you think. Give me suggestions. This has been Ad Astra. Uh, at least the main game Ad Astra. I just wanted to say thank you to all of you who are still watching to this point in the video. Uh, because I, I suppose you are... You are most likely those 1,000 people who have watched all the videos, and just a huge thank you to all of you. I really appreciate it. And yeah, I know there is a, or, or like there are many of the people that are subscribed to me that are not interested in in visual novels, but I think there are more people that are. So I will probably play, or not probably. I will continue playing visual novels, but I will also do other stuff as well. But uh, I guess it's now this is now more or less a visual novel channel. <laughs> Oh my god, but anyhow, thank you so much guys for watching, and I'm sure that all of you who are watching to this part are subscribed, so just go leave a, leave a like and ring the bell. <laughs> oh, I love you guys, thank you so much for watching again. <sighs> Take care guys, and remember that you are loved and appreciated, and that you should be proud of who you are, because I so much want to see you in the next video that maybe won't be an Adastra video. It might be something else, but we will find it out together.